These islands are only about as far from the South Pole as London is from the North. They enjoy a mild climate. Yet most are uninhabited, except during one short period of the year. This is the story of one hectic Falkland summer. The Falkland Islands lie about 350 miles off the South American mainland. There are over 200 islands all told, in two main groups, East and West Falklands. The capital, Port Stanley, is in East Falklands. Stanley houses about half of the island's entire population of under 2,000 people. The islands themselves could easily lie off the northwest coast of Scotland. They'd be quite at home among the Shetlands. The soil is peaty. There are no native trees. And there's little cultivated land. Not, you might think, much of a setting for wildlife. But you'd be wrong. The giant kelp beds that surround most of the islands are rich in food for seabirds. A meeting of cold and warm currents produces huge shoals of the shrimp-like krill and squid on which penguins and albatrosses feed. Though the wind blows a good deal of the time, with gales about four days a month, it never gets really cold, even in winter. So visiting seabirds, as well as the 40-odd resident land species, survive remarkably well. On the rare summer days when the air is still, the mornings sometimes start with a heat mist. The air is always clear, so that when the sun does break through, its light is startlingly brilliant. Summer comes to the Falklands in September. That's when the first seabirds arrive. It's also the time when communication between the islands starts to become easier. The beaver float plane from Port Stanley is the only easy way of bringing mail and stores, not to mention visitors, to some of the outlying settlements. This time, the beaver brings with it two unusual summer visitors. Survival wildlife photographer Cindy Buxton is no stranger to the Falklands. The previous year she was here to make a film about rockhopper penguins. Now she returns to tell the equally remarkable story of the explosion of life that takes place during a Falkland summer. To the nesting skewers, at least, she's not welcome. Her teammate and assistant, Annie Price, is making a return visit also. Out in the camp, as it's called, which simply means away from Port Stanley, Sheep farming is the sole occupation. In the Falklands, wildlife and people live side by side without serious conflict, though there is some competition between sheep and these upland geese. They're both grass eaters. On the whole, the farmers tolerate the geese. The sheep have one habitat, the spongy meadows. The wildlife of the Falklands has at least three each with its separate communities. First, there's the shoreline, 
This is the haunt of the mollusk, crustacean, and seaweed eaters, like these handsome kelp geese. The barred beauty is the female. The Patagonian crested duck has a drink of seawater. Waders, like these black oyster catchers, haunt the shore. A few yards out, cruise a pair of flightless steamer ducks. A kelp gull commutes between habitats. The king shags frequent the second of these, the rocky cliffs. They nest on the flat cliff tops in vast numbers. Their close relatives, the rock shags, choose the more inaccessible ledges lower down. The lowest cliff levels of all are where the fur seals haul out and have their pups. The third main habitat is the tussock grass. That's where this Magellan penguin is going with a beak full of nesting material. Tussock is the tallest native plant in the Falklands. It grows in dense clumps, each one standing on its own pedestal of soil and roots. In it, around it, and in burrows under it, lives a busy and varied community of animals. The elephant seals simply use the tussock for relaxing and sunbathing. For many species of birds, the tussock is vital to their summer activities. Cindy Buxton has selected one tussock in particular. It's the nesting place, not of this Falkland thrush, it's raising a family nearby, but of a pair of Magellan penguins. The penguins have their nest in a burrow underneath this tussock clump. That's a southern house wren expressing its disapproval of the excavations. The trick is to introduce the hide, a crate built by the team, before the penguins settle down to laying their eggs. A tussock bird. You meet this character everywhere. They're intensely curious. This one has a nest in the tussock grass. Cindy blocks out the light with dried grass, closely watched by a military starling. There's the female entering the nest. The door of the crate is closed and the whole contraption covered with tarpaulin. Now the hide will be left while the Magellan penguins get accustomed to the idea. Because there's no marked change between seasons, nesting starts early. A piping party of Magellanic oyster catchers displays together. Nearby, the black oyster catcher. By early October, which corresponds to April in the northern hemisphere, there are nests everywhere around the shoreline. A ruddy-headed goose, locally called a Brent. A female upland goose, bigger and without the white ring round the eye. A female kelp goose, almost invisible in the grass. Another upland goose. A common snipe, camouflage experts the world over. In habitat number two, the cliff dwelling community is equally hard at work. The king shags in full breeding finery are settling disputes over nesting territory. Rockhopper penguins, usually quarrelsome, look on from their nests next door. A king shag's nest is a fairly rudimentary affair, a sort of mud wedding cake with very little decoration on top of it. Just the same, the collection of ornaments for the cake plays a big part in a shag's domestic life. The grass and seaweed collected eventually find their way to the top of the nest as a sort of bed for eggs and young. 
but just as important is the ritual presentation of the goodies to one's mate. It's rather like bringing your fiancé a bunch of roses. It helps to strengthen the pair bond. The handover doesn't always go as smoothly as that. There are often rivals waiting to steal the gifts that the incoming suitors bring. Eventually, everybody gets the nest lined and the hard work of egg laying and incubation can begin. On the cliff face, the less numerous rock shags are going through much the same ritual. They're easily told from the king shags, not only by their more solitary lifestyle, but by their red face patches. There's the tussock bird, minding other people's business again. Quarrels over nesting space are slightly more hazardous when you live on a ledge about as wide as a windowsill. Five species of penguins nest in the Falklands. These are Magellans. Locally, they're called jackasses because of the braying sound they make. They return to the Falklands from deep oceanic waters late in September and in early October. They're black-footed penguins with close relatives in Peru, the Galapagos and South Africa. Most black-footed penguins nest in burrows, usually within a hundred yards of the shore. Some choose the grassy meadows for their nesting sites. Magellan penguin colonies are far calmer than the crowded, quarrelsome rookeries of the surface nesting species. But they're noisy enough, especially at the start of the season, when a good deal of braying goes on. A great many Magellans nest in the tussock grass. That's where this one is headed. The mate calls from the entrance to the burrow. That turning of the head is typical of a Magellan that's trying to get a good look at a passing stranger. It suggests that they don't have very good binocular vision. A meeting with one's mate at the entrance to the burrow calls for a raucous braying duet. A preening session follows. Then, the penguin coming on duty makes a cautious descent to inspect the nesting chamber.
tussock grass thins out and almost disappears on the flat space where the elephant seals do their courting and give birth to their pups. The biggest of all the seals, the bulls may weigh over three tons, can demolish everything, even the hardy tussock with their ponderous lumberings after mates and in battles with rivals. It's the bull's nose that gives the species its name. The trunk-like nose plays an important part in mating displays and rivalry. The most magnificent noses belong to the fully mature bulls. But only a female could produce these delicate movements of the flippers. are male chauvinism personified. In their tank-like peregrinations about the colony, they bulldoze the cows out of the way and sometimes actually crush and kill babies who are unlucky enough to get in their path. The young who escape the infanticidal tendencies of their fathers grow quickly on mother's milk. Seal's milk is one of the richest baby foods in nature. These are just over a week old. This intruder is a wandering sea lion bull who probably just wishes to take a short cut across the elephant seal colony. Nevertheless, he's quite capable of attacking and killing a calf, and the elephant seals know it. The sea lion is eventually seen off and sent packing, not by a bull, but by an elephant seal cow. Apart from the sea lions, who also prey on penguins at sea, there are no mammal predators in the Falklands. But there are a number of piratical birds. Here, perched on top of a pile of rocks, are two of the arch villains, striated caracaras, locally called Johnny Rooks. This pair of caracaras are displaying, which means they're nesting and will soon have hungry young to feed. The caracara's nest is under this rocky overhang. The Johnny Rook has an equally rapacious relative, the handsome carancho, or crested caracara. Both these buzzard-like birds are capable of stealing eggs or chicks, 
though they're not above making do with carrion. Third on the list of baddies is the turkey vulture. As its name implies, it's much more interested in scavenging from carcasses than in killing for its living. It has a red face and the upswept wings give it away in flight. The red-backed hawk is a neat falcon-like predator. They're really buzzards. That's the female on the right. They nest in craggy places and feed on small mammals and birds. When summer comes to the Falklands, the albatrosses cease their wanderings of the southern oceans and make port to breed. Only one species nests in the Falklands, the elegant black-browed albatross. There's the black brow, which gives the species its name. The beak is hook-tipped for picking seafood from the wave tops. But the beak is also capable of giving the gentlest of caresses. There's something very old-fashioned about an albatross's courtship. The reason albatrosses are almost totally confined to the Southern Ocean is that they need the constant strong winds that blow there to exploit their soaring method of flight. On the rare days that the wind fails them, they need a clear space to get airspeed for takeoff. And even then, they don't always make it. Often, the black-browed albatrosses share a nesting site with rockhopper penguins. This one is exclusive to albatrosses, hence its air of total tranquility. Sharing with rockhopper penguins is rather like living next door to a constantly rehearsing pop group. Bird activity in the Falklands doesn't stop with the setting sun. This is the time when thousands of petrels make their landfall and scuttle into their nesting burrows. It's also the time when another nocturnal worker in the bird world seeks out the burrow of her choice. Cindy cautiously moves into the packing crate hide which looks into the underground and previously secret world of the Magellan penguin. Their underground behavior has never been filmed before. Cindy had already accustomed the nesting penguins to an increasing amount of light. They've accepted it without any sign of disturbance. So now filming of their private life, four feet beneath the tussock clump, can begin. The penguin has laid two eggs. They start out white, but rapidly become stained with the peaty soil. She and her mate will incubate now for 33 days. Cindy was to return at regular intervals to film the pair's progress. A giant petrel is nearly as big as a black-browed albatross. But mere size avails it nothing when the caracaras move in. First, a probing attack, successfully resisted. Then the raiders spot an unguarded nest. There goes the embryo.
Gradually, a mere affray builds up to riot proportions. A few gallant defenders stay staunchly at their posts. Later, we'll see the effect of this attack on the petrel's breeding success. In the King Shag colony, early chicks are hatching. If anyone doubts that the very first birds evolved from reptiles, this close look at a shag chick may prompt a change of mind. At two weeks, this partly feathered youngster looks a shade less reptilian. Three weeks and the chicks are growing fast on a diet of pre-digested fish. In the middle stories of the cliff tenement, the rock shags are in full production too. Naturally, there are regular inspections by the tussock bird. That's a family of flightless steamer ducks down below. Back at the Magellan penguin burrow, beneath the tussock grass, Cindy Buxton was on duty in her packing case hide to film the emergence of the first chick. Often, her vigil lasted all night. That's when the chicks were most active. The changeover at the nest usually takes place in the evening. The parent coming on duty has been at sea all day, catching krill, squid and small fish. The off-duty bird emerges to greet its mate, an unvarying ceremony accompanied by loud braying. Down in the burrow, the second egg is pipping. Ceremonial circlings completed, the returning parent goes below to take over nest duties. The off-duty penguin is about to head seawards to catch the next lot of food for itself and the chick so oil must be collected from the preen gland in the tail to waterproof the feathers. And so, off to sea, while down below in the tussock clump, the night shift takes over. A parallel series of events is taking place in the albatross colony. The first young are out of the egg. Overhead, the caracaras watch for an unwary chick. But the albatrosses are conscientious parents and seldom leave either young or eggs unprotected. Of all the Falklands birds, the albatross young are the slowest to develop. This youngster is about eight weeks old. It won't leave the colony for two months. Meantime, the parents shovel pre-digested fish into their offspring's beaks 
while adults overhead ferry in consignments of freshly caught seafood. There's quite enough danger from predatory birds like caracaros and skewers without having to suffer aggression from one's own kind. This family of upland geese are being fiercely attacked by a male of their own species. He seems already to have paid for his aggressive nature with a bad neck wound. It's hard to say why he should behave so viciously towards these goslings. Perhaps the whole family has intruded on his territory. Even after he's chased off the female, he still has a go at one of the goslings lagging behind. Down in the Magellan burrow, there are now two chicks. The parents feed them twice nightly, taking about 20 minutes over each session. The penguins were quite exhausted by the night's duties. The penguins weren't the only ones. Cindy Buxton was now often spending all night in the packing case hide, filming them. Next evening, changeover takes place once again. It's a ritual which will be repeated every day for the next five weeks. The black-crowned night herons also nest in the tussock grass usually closer to the shore than the Magellans. They like to be near to rock pools where they can catch fish and crabs. This one's caught a tussock bird. Tussock clumps do very nicely in place of trees. The herons simply piling sticks and dead grass on top to make their nests. Like most of the Falklands 40-odd resident breeding birds, they're a separate subspecies, differing very slightly from night herons in other parts of the world. The night heron colonies are seldom more than 20 strong. The South American terns raise their young among the tussock in quarrelsome communities numbering thousands. The terns have had a highly successful breeding season. To a large extent, their numbers protect them from predation. Not so the giant petrels. Now you can see the devastating effect of that caracara raid on their eggs. Very few nests on that isolated plateau beside the rockhopper colony have produced any chicks. There's just a handful of survivors. Kelp gulls are one of the Falklands' most successful species. They're much larger than the strident, red-beaked dolphin gulls. Both species often rear their young side by side. That's the kelp gull with black back and yellow bill. The smaller dolphin gull is slaty grey and has a red bill and red legs. Despite their apparent tolerance of each other as nesting neighbours, woe betide a dolphin chick that wanders into a kelp gull district. The victim doesn't necessarily have to be a chick of the other species. Any dolphin or kelp gull youngster who strays too far from home is likely to be harassed. Life for the growing goose families is comparatively sheltered. Upland or kelp geese, 
they're led in convoy by devoted parents. As soon as possible after hatching, the young wildfowl are led down to the shoreline for swimming lessons. This is a convoy of Patagonian crested ducks. Nearby, an upland goose prepares to launch her flotilla. chicks spend a good deal of their time at the entrance to the burrow in the tussock grass, inspected, of course, by the tussock bird. On-duty parents preen and call for their mates to relieve them at the nest. Always there are demanding young to be crammed full of krill and squid. At last comes the welcome moment of relief. and away down to the sea to catch another load of food. In the elephant seal colony, two important end-of-season activities are taking place. Cindy is making last-minute recordings of aggressive bulls before they return to the sea. The seals themselves are making their own preparations for that return. They're molting to grow a fine new winter coat. The gulls and terns have deserted their colonies now and moved down to the beach with their young. The young terns still cry to be fed, though in a week or two now they'll join the parties offshore to catch fish for themselves. On their way down to the beach, the kelp gull young band together for protection from their relatives. They've learned how hard life can be in the tough kindergarten of the gull colony.
All gulls are piratical by nature, so perhaps such treatment does have some survival value in adult life. The two young Magellan penguins at the tussock plump burrow are now 10 weeks old and losing their baby down. The feathers show through clearly beneath the fluff. There's no let up in either braying or feeding. South Atlantic summer will be gone by the end of April. In late March, there's still time for a final sunbathe in the sea lion colony. The fur seal and sea lions are sleek, well fed and winter seaworthy. King shag young are sleek and ready for sea too. Parties practice swimming, foraging and diving at the tide's edge. The kelp beds may seem a safe and sheltered place, but predators are on the lookout everywhere. The attacker is a giant petrel. They're killers as well as scavengers. Young seabirds like these king shags are favorite targets. The pattern of predation is a complex one. Earlier in the summer, the petrels lost their eggs to the caracaras. Now it's the petrels' turn to kill in order to eat. The end of the summer is a miserable time for the adult penguins. It's a situation that applies to many of the water birds. They've just finished an extremely arduous nesting season and now they've got to molt. The upland geese in the background have already shed their flight feathers. For the next month or so, they'll be as flightless as the penguins. Once they start molting, the penguins will be even worse off. For three weeks, they won't be able to go to sea to feed. They'll have to live on the fat stored in their bodies. Such considerations don't worry the steamer ducks. They're flightless anyway. And now the molt is well underway. Adult penguins stand around looking like badly moth-eaten rolls of carpet.
A penguin has more feathers than any other bird, and when it sheds them, it makes more mess. It's like the end of summer anywhere, but slightly more so. Those winds have all the power of the Southern Ocean behind them. The young albatrosses greet the winds with much flapping of newly fledged wings. To them, the winds are home. Without them, they couldn't navigate the southern seas or round Cape Horn as easily as you and I take a casual stroll. They take four months, longer than all the other Falklands birds, to reach maturity. Their parents are the first ashore and the young are the last to put out to sea. When at last they do set sail, and surely you have to talk of an ocean traveller in nautical terms, they sometimes face one last hazard from the unfriendly land. The villainous caracaras are waiting to try to knock them down into the sea. This young black-browed albatross made it safely. In the Falklands, it can blow up a gale at any time of year. But gales are more frequent once summer dies. Bird colonies are empty now, except of course for the tussock bird, that snapper up of inconsiderable trifles. And the sheath bills, snowy white and born scavengers. Many of them move north from the Antarctic to winter here. For a sheath bill, there's no better way to start the winter than by seeing what the summer visitors have left behind. To anyone but a sheath bill or tussock bird, this array of odiferous mud cones must look both unappetizing and unpromising. But the very presence of these nests is proof that once again, this unique group of islands has played a key part in restocking the wildest oceans in the world with their wealth of seabirds. 